Good morning. Selamat pagi. I'm Gary Quinlan, Australia's Ambassador to Indonesia. First, I want to acknowledge Tokunai-san from the Japanese Embassy in Jakarta. You honour the dead with a very deep service by your presence here today. The events on this beach on this day, 16 February in 1942, were among the bloodiest and most horrific of the war crimes committed in the Pacific during the Second World War. The commemorative plaque displayed on this beach, which you see behind me, and dedicated on the 75th anniversary of the killings on Rudgy Beach three years ago, states simply, and I quote, This beach is haloed ground. Australia was only 41 years old as a nation in February 1942, but we'd been born into what turned out to be the most violent 30 years in human history. World Wars I and II, almost 100 million people dead. Singapore fell in a few weeks on the 15th of February. Over 1,800 young Australian defenders were killed. 15,000 were captured and 5,000 of those were to die. The emotional shock to Australia was immense. Four days later, Darwin was bombed in the first of almost 300 attacks. As Prime Minister Curtin said, the battle for Singapore is over. The battle for Australia has begun. Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies, fell quickly and the Japanese then moved on New Guinea. 1942 was the most dangerous moment in Australian history, but our response forged genuine national unity among the six states and the population for the first time in our short history, and it reinforced the sense of identity which had begun to emerge at Gallipoli. War, of course, is always a terrible thing, savage, often senseless, but history has shown that it is sometimes a necessary last resort. In World War II, we were fighting against Nazism, fascism and Japanese militarism, and across the whole globe, we were fighting for the very survival of what we would call civilization. Certainly our freedom, but more deeply for the human values and rights that give, give that freedom its meaning. Of the 7 million Australians in 1942, men, women, the elderly, children, the infirm, one million were in uniform. This was the bigger background against which this vicious day here on Rudgy Beach occurred. On the morning of 16 February, over 80 people were stranded here on the beach, evacuees from Singapore as it fell. Most were survivors of the sinking under Japanese attack of the vessel, the SS Viner Brook, in the Straits of Sumatra, or from other vessels similarly attacked. The survivors included civilians, sailors, military personnel, and 22 Australian nurses. Some were wounded from the fighting in Singapore, and some from the Japanese attacks on their vessels. The 32 nurses were part of a group of 65 Australian Army nurses who were on the Viner Brook. Twelve of these died during the sinking, 21 were murdered on the beach, 32 were interned, only 24 survived the war, and only one, Vivian Bullwinkle, survived the Rudgy Beach Massacre. The killings were systematic, and merciless. The survivors were divided into three groups, two for the male soldiers and civilians and the third for the nurses. The remaining were the wounded, here on the beach, many on makeshift stretchers. The men were taken down to the beach and around the southern headland. The first group were mostly bayoneted in just two minutes. The second were shot and bayoneted. Two miraculously survived. The nurses saw the Japanese soldiers returning, wiping blood off their bayonets. The nurses and a British civilian, Mrs. Betteridge, 
were ordered to walk into the sea and as they did so, they were machine gunned and bayoneted. Most of the wounded on the beach, possibly 10, were then also murdered. The heroism and the stoicism of the nurses facing this fate was remarkable. There was no panic. As the soldiers killed the men, there was probably a chance for the nurses to run for the jungle or even for strong swimmers to dash for the sea. But they were nurses. Their oath was to care for the sick and wounded of whom there were many on the beach, and they stayed with them. One can only imagine that they could hardly contemplate that the wounded would be bayoneted too. The story of Rudgy Beach is shocking to all of us and remains shocking to all of us. And it's very deeply and personally emotional for the families that remain. These are powerful feelings that honour those who died here. They're feelings that we must ensure never fade. We must ensure that this terrible story is never lost as a statement about how bad human beings can be and therefore how much we must constantly strive to release the better angels of our nature. Ultimately, it is the better angels we honour today. Fellow human beings under extraordinary threat who are the very best among us. We must cherish the mystic cords of their memory which we must never allow to be broken. As I conclude, let me say that the work of the Friends of Banker Island, uh, the individual families, the community groups, the historians, the authors, the nurses groups and governments are decisive to safeguarding this living memory. And I want to say how inspirational these efforts are. Michael Noyce has told me that interest in this terrible event is growing among some of our younger generation and that is vital if we are to preserve the living memory and if we are to be able to salvage some good for our future from what happened today on this beach in 1942, lest we forget.